Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together. Let's give Jesus some praise today. I want to hear you guys sing it loud. I was buried beneath my shame. Praise Jesus. Well, good morning, everyone. Did you have a good New Year? Yeah? Who fell asleep by 11 o'clock on New Year's Eve? Yeah, most of us, right? We're getting old. You know, what are we going to say? Well, hey, if you're a guest today, I'm Pastor Andy. I'm glad you guys are here with us. Let's keep singing to the Lord. Let's give him our prayer, our praise. Let's give him everything we've got this morning. Keep on singing.
Praise and honor this morning. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. You could be seated. I'm so glad to see you guys today. We'd still worship if you weren't here, but you know, you're here. So let's worship together. You guys sound great today. This might be the day that I say, Balcony, let's have a competition with the people on the floor. Do you guys think you could beat them? Oh, oh, I hear it. Okay, let's keep it down now, keep it down. If this is your first time here, I'm Pastor Andy, and uh, it's an honor to lead worship to you guys and just hear your singing, giving glory to Jesus. It's the first Sunday of the month, too, and it's one of my favorites because we take the Lord's Supper. And I love seeing people coming to the table, just taking the time, making it a quiet, a reverent time before the Lord, and thanking Him for His life, for His, his brokenness his humility, that he put down his life for us. And so when we come to the table, don't rush through it. Take your time at the table and 
Thank him for his broken body. When you break a piece of bread off, thank him for his broken body. Thank him that even though he had the power to walk on water, to raise dead people to life, to cure disease, he could have come down from the cross, but he chose to stay. He chose to pay our penalty. And this, the beating that he took was for us. It was for our sin, for our transgression, the word says. But we are healed because of the beating he took. We are healed because he laid his life down. Amen? And we thank him for that. We dip this bread in the juice, symbolizing his blood poured out for us. And again, don't rush through it. What else is there to thank the Lord greater than this? You know, we, we are in a new season now. We're in a new year. But it wouldn't be new if it weren't for Christ. It wouldn't be good if it weren't for Christ. What is life worth living without him? So take the time to thank him for his faithfulness, for his humility, him laying down his life for us. You might be wondering, can I do this here? I, I've never been to church here before. Uh, you don't have to be a member to take communion. We do ask that you are a believer in Christ, that his life is in you. And then if that's the case, then come on down. If you aren't a believer in Christ, if you're still just looking into this, and you'd like to know more later, I'd love to meet you after church. Any one of our pastors would. We'd love to talk with you. But let's ask the Lord to bless this bread and this juice and make this a time of quietness before him as the band continues to, to lead worship over the next few songs. Take the time between you and the Lord to deal with whatever he's dealing with you in your heart. Praise him for working in your life. You know, he never leaves us word says he never forsakes us. He never forgets us. There are those dry seasons that we go through in life, but he never leaves. He's always pruning us, always growing us into what he wants us to be. So let's praise him for that this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come together as a community and worship you. You are amazing in all you do. All that you are, Lord, you are faithful. You are humble. Lord, you are the creator of all the universe, and yet you came to live among us, to be part of the world that you created, to go through the challenges that we've gone through. And you freely laid your life down, Jesus. That's what we thank you for right now. And as you have told us to, we remember this. We remember you, and we thank you. May our life reflect your love for each other, May we walk your path of righteousness because you are in us, Jesus. And we praise you. Amen. You guys are free to come when you're ready.
sing that chorus or praise the name. Awesome. Are you happy to be here this morning, Westside? That was awesome stuff. Hey, my name is Andrew Clark. I'm the youth pastor here, um, and I'm so excited for you guys to be with us this morning. Um, we're going to continue our series called Empty Wells. We're going to be picking up right where we left off last week. Um, but I find it necessary before we begin, would you pray with me uh, that God would continue to bless our worship service this morning? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for who you are. Father, we thank you for the way that you love us, the way that you cherish us, the way that you run after us, God. 
Father, we praise your name, God. It is so exciting to think about our future, to, to praise your name forevermore, God, to be up with you and the angels singing. Father, we pray over these next few moments that it would glorify you, God, that it would be praise to you. Father, we pray that it would be your words, not mine. We pray for open hearts and open ears for what you would have for us. And God, we are so excited um, just to see how you will move in our lives. So, Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you in your name. Amen. Well, awesome. Westside, I'm so glad you guys are here with us this morning. Uh, we're going to, like I said, picking up in John chapter 4. And if you were with us last week, um, we were talking about this woman at the well. And if you weren't here, I would strongly encourage that you go on our app or on our, our website and you would watch. Because uh, A.J. Garcia, who spoke last week, did a phenomenal job getting us to the point of where we're at. He spoke last week on this idea of our empty wells. Right? He, he shared how Jesus is going from Judea to Galilee. And normally as a Jewish man, they would have actually tried to avoid this country called Samaria that was sandwiched between the two countries. They would have tried to avoid it because Samaria was full of Gentiles and people that they did not want to deal with. And yet we read in John chapter 4 at the very beginning, Jesus says this. He says, I have to go to Galilee. He, he had to. This, there's an intention uh, given to his need to go there. This is not something done haphazardly. This is not something just done for kicks and giggles. Like this is him genuinely saying, I have to go to Samaria. And this is just weird because where they're at, as we talked about, was, it would have been way easier to avoid the country altogether. They would have followed the coastline on either side of this country and they would have been able to stick to their cultural norms. Right? And we read though that Jesus goes and he arrives in Samaria at the middle of the day around noon. The, one of the, almost the hottest part of the day, and they find this well called Jacob's Well. It's at the center of the city, and, and he goes, and he sits, and he rests, and he sends the disciples into town to, to get some food or to collect some items, and he sits, and he waits, and this woman approaches, and they begin to have this dialogue, right, and they begin to talk about uh, Jesus asks her for a drink of water, and she, she's kind of thrown off because, A, Jesus is a man. As a man, he, he probably shouldn't have been interacting with her in this day and age. And secondly, he's, he's not of her kind, right? He's a Jewish man. She's a Gentile. They, they should not have been interacting culturally, right? And then, then on top of that, there's this understanding that Jesus is a rabbi. So even more so, this is a three strikes and you're out situation. This is, this is an awkward, weird situation as this dialogue is beginning to happen between the two of them. And as we learn that there's this desire for her to, to feel full, to receive water, like this, this thing that Jesus calls living water. This fact that she never wants to have come to come back to this well. And what Jesus is speaking to is the spiritual realm. He's saying, I offer you a thing called spiritual water. He's talking about this idea of salvation. This idea that you can inherit your righteousness, you can inherit, your, your, your redemption comes from belief in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is offering her this thing called living water. She can leave this well, but she can also leave her other personal wells. Right, the wells that we always seem to come back to. Right, there's always that one thing that when we're feeling down, when we're feeling empty, when we're feeling left behind, when we're struggling, when we feel like we're not making it, there's something that we keep going back to. And I don't know what that is for you, but there's, there's just that one thing that always seems to draw us back. It's, it might just be something as, as simple as our, our, our humor, right? We use our humor to protect ourselves. For others, it might be something like drugs or alcohol, and, and there's pornography, and there's, there's some really intense things, right? There's things that we keep just drawing us back, and it fills us up for a moment just to be let down Again, Jesus says, I, I can give you this living water, and you will never have to go back to those wells. So this morning, we're picking up right as this conversation is happening. Jesus is offered her living water, and she says, I, I want that living water. I, I want this living water that you talk about. And then this conversation happens. This, John chapter 4, verse 16, it says this. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Right? She's just asked for water. And this is what Jesus says, go call your husband and come back. Verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. But verse 18, the fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man that you now have, he's not even your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Like, she's like, whoa. Whoa. Dang, got me. Like there's like this interaction where Jesus said, hey, go get your husband. Go, go find the one that you, you call your husband, the man that you're in love with, right? The man that you were supposed to marry. Go find that man and come back because potentially he might want this living water too. And what I love is, and I, I really, I, I connect with this lady when she says, what? I, I don't have a husband. 
Like she's literally sitting in the face of Jesus, having this conversation, and she may not put the pieces together of who he really is, but she's trying to kind of avoid the question. Now, I don't, I don't have a husband, right? And, and Jesus like, no, for real, for real, I know you don't have a husband. You've had five. In fact, you're with a sixth man now. Like he's like not even playing games with her, just totally throwing her under the bus. And she, there, <laughs> you must be a prophet. Like it's just so nonchalant in this interaction happening. And yet we find it so, so connected to her because she's, she's kind of doing what I like to call her or what my siblings and I used to do when we were younger. She's giving the, the what response. Right? As kids, we grew up that if mom or dad asked us to do something, that if they said, hey, go clean your room, go help with the dishes, uh, pick this up, go help that, the, the, the initial response always, whether we were in their face or in the whole different room, was to just respond with, what? <laughs> Parents, you've probably heard this response. Hey, go clean your room. What? Like me asking what, I'm assuming they're not really serious about what they said. Like if, if I ask what, they're going to rethink, oh, you know what? I don't really want him to clean his room. And they're going to ask me to do something completely different that I would like to do. Right? This was just a natural response. It would be, what? Like go do this. What? Go do this. What? Like, what? like that, that is, and I find myself to this day, my wife will say something. I'm like, what? Like it's just like a natural <laughs> natural avoidance, right? Because me asking what, I'm trying to re avoid responsibility. I'm, maybe I'm trying to avoid some consequences that are due to me. Maybe I, there's some repercussions for some choices I've made. So if I ask what, uh, hopefully they're going to rethink what they just asked me. And normally what ends up happening is my mother would play this really cool drum beat with a wooden spoon on the counter. And we're like, oh, she's serious, serious. And so then we knew that what she said is what she meant. But I feel like this is what this woman is doing. She's almost like, what? I don't have a husband. Right? She's trying to avoid the question. It's just a sidestep the question. She's trying to avoid the obvious. And I wonder for you and I, how often do we find ourselves avoiding the obvious, especially with God? If we say, if, if, if I just don't really respond to what I'm actually dealing with, if I, if I avoid the obvious situation in my life, if, if I really avoid the obvious hurt that's going on, if, if I just push it to the side, if I just sidestep that, then I don't actually have to get any help. I, I don't actually have to get any healing because I've honestly dealt with this long enough that it's just kind of natural for me. I've, I've dealt with this long enough that I just kind of have learned to deal with it, right? If, if I avoid the obvious... I've become pretty comfortable with this. And we do it time and time and time again with God. You feel the tug. You feel the pull. You, you know where the help is. You, you know how to get the healing. You, you know how to get fixed. But we also know that if I'm going to get help, it's probably going to hurt a little bit. And so I'm just going to avoid it. You see, for adults... I think a lot of us have graduated from the what question to just simply being fake. We, we've, uh, we've graduated from this idea of just asking what, and now we do a thing called wearing masks. Right? We, we put a mask on because if we think if we cover up who I really am, what I'm really dealing with, then I don't have to deal with it. Me, me being a pastor's kid, let me tell you this. I am a professional mask wearer. Okay, I, I, th get, hear me out. As a pastor's kid, I, I have two choices. Stereotypically, I have two choices in my life. Be a Bible-thumping Christian believer or prison, right? Like those are my two <laughs> stereotypical <laughs> choices. When you think of pastors, because you think of the kid who woke up and before he could talk had the entire Bible memorized, wakes up singing Amazing Grace, and lives in the church, right? Or they're in prison on heroin. Like, that's like, those are my, that's the line I was born with. I'm like, what if I just want to, like, dance in the middle? Like, am I not allowed to do that? Not the heroin side. But, like, I'm just like, <laughs> but seriously, there, there's this point where then as a, as a pastor, as a PK, I had to learn, you know what, if I just slide a mask on, if, if I just act like I'm fine because there's these unspoken expectations, no one ever said I had to be perfect. No one ever said I, I couldn't be the kid that got kicked out of youth group. No one, no one ever said I had to be the one that didn't cause distractions. There's just almost this unspoken expectation that comes with it that if I just wear a mask that everything's okay, everything's fine, I don't have any issues, I don't have any problems, I, I, I'm not struggling with anything, right? I, I have it all together, right? I, I'm not going to embarrass my family, right? I, I, I'm going to be a good person, right? Because that's what I'm supposed to be, right? If I just wear this mask that says I'm fine, then I'm fine. 
And we begin to live our lives wearing these masks. For some of us, it's the funny guy mask, right? If I'm always funny, if I'm always quick-witted, then you don't, gotta have, you don't have to see the depression I'm actually dealing with. It's, it's the cool guy mask, right? Whatever you say to me just rolls off my shoulder because I'm way too cool, way too laid back. I don't got no insecurities. They're raging insecurities, but I don't got to deal with them. You don't got to know about that because I'm wearing the cool guy mask. The perfect mom mask. Social media, my kids smile all the time. My kids change their own diapers. I don't go to bed crying at night, and I don't want to not wake up in the morning, right? But at this mask, this perfect mom mask, I have it all together. The professional, right? If, if I put this mask on that says, I'm a professional, I'm a CEO, I got it all together. I can reach the peak. I can reach the top of what I want to do. Even though I have my doubts, even though I have my fears, I'm still a professional. I wear the suit, I have the look, and I am the look. I don't have any questions. You see, we put these masks on and we think, if I wear this, then I can avoid the obvious hurt in my life. If I wear this, I can avoid the obvious pain I'm dealing with. If I wear this mask, I can avoid the obvious situation that is going on and I can't seem to find an answer for. So we wear a mask. See, the danger with masks is that, the, that, that, that relationship you get in because of the mask you wore, you better get used to keeping that mask on. That promotion you got, that job you got because of the mask you wear, you better get comfortable in that mask. Because if whenever that mask comes off, whenever it all comes spilling out and they see who you really are, and you've never dealt with that pain, you've never dealt with that issues, you're going to radically change some people's perspective. You're going to radically change some people's lives if they see who you really are. It, the, the, the thought is this. It is not one that you should wear a mask that you should hide. You shouldn't wear a mask at all because once that mask goes on, you have to understand it is incredibly difficult to get off because you are avoiding the necessity of vulnerability and healing. You're better off to just never wear the mask to begin with or to take it off now and just deal with what you have to deal with. Get some help. Get some healing. Get some things figured out. And maybe, maybe start following Jesus Christ. You see, that's what this woman is doing. She, she's graduated to this point where now she's, she's just sidestepping the question. Right? Because when he brings up that she's had five husbands... When he brings up that she's not even with her fifth husband, she's with another sixth random dude, he's bringing up her embarrassment, her pain, and her hurt. See, when I read scripture, I read it from a standpoint, this is a real person. This is a real interaction that happened. This, this is a really a woman who, who is really talking to Jesus right here, right now. Which means this woman at one point was a child. Which means this woman at one point had dreams. She had aspirations. Maybe this woman had a dream that she would be a wife. And she would have a home, and she would have kids, right? And she would have a husband, one husband, who loved her and cherished her, right? This woman was someone. And now she finds herself showing up at the well in the middle of the day. Because if she goes in the morning, she's sick and tired of hearing the gossip about her. And she knows if she goes in the evening, they're just going to talk about who she's going home with tonight. So it's just easier for her to not deal with her embarrassment. To not deal with the obvious pain and just live her life. No dreams, no aspirations. This is what I have. And it begs the question of this what happens when you've given your everything? What do you respond? How do you respond when you've given everything? You've, you've given all your love, all your hope, all your dreams, all your aspirations just to have them stomped on, neglected, turned down, or told they're not worth it. How do you respond? You see, all this woman was looking for was love. And the truth is, if you're looking for love and you don't first love yourself, you will start looking for love in any place you can find it, even if that love isn't real. And that's what this woman is dealing with. And so as she's having this interaction with Jesus, you can see the wheels begin to turn in her mind. She begins to realize more and more, this man is not just a random man. This man is not here to use me. This man is not my next man. This, this man is actually talking about something much deeper, much more than just my natural pain and the things I'm dealing with right now. He's trying to get to my obvious situation and dealing with that. See, the reality of Christ is this. 
He sees you and he seeks you. He sees everything that you've done. He, he sees who you are. He sees the life that you lived. And he still continually is seeking you out. You can go ahead and put the walls up. You can go ahead and stay behind the fence. Go ahead and wear the mask. Go ahead and avoid the obvious. He doesn't care because he still sees you and he still seeks you out. You see, if you want to move forward, you have to let go of what's holding you back. And for Jesus, that's what he is saying to this woman. If you want this living water, you have to understand that when you take this living water, you are made new. You being full, you being filled up, you feeling like you're continually growing, that's because you're new. You are made new. You are a new creation in Christ. That's what the gospel is. So if you're going to step forward into your life, if you're going to step forward into your future, if you're going to step forward into what is called for you, you have to let go of what's holding your back. Your past no longer defines you when you're with Jesus Christ. The things that you've tried to hide, the issues that you've tried to deal with, the, the ones that you've tried to avoid, those no longer define who you are when you have Jesus Christ. What defines you is that you are a new creation, that you are loved, that you are cherished, that you mean something, that you are worth more than anything to him. See, Christ says you are fully known and you are fully loved. He knows everything and anything about you, and yet he still says, you're my favorite. You still mean the most to me. You still have a future. You still have an opportunity. You will find someone that means something because you mean something to me. So this is what I would love to do. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I want just a personal moment. Right? This, this means taking the mask off. This might mean no longer avoiding the obvious. This, this might mean a little vulnerability. But why not this first Sunday of this new year, why, why not take the moment to say, God, it's yours. God, I, I'm tired of dealing with this pain. I'm tired of avoiding the obvious. I, I want to take this mask off, God. I want to start fresh. I want to start new. And I want to start a life in you. So I would love, if that's you this morning, if that's what you're looking for, would you just slip your hand up? I just want to pray for you. Yeah, it's awesome. God, you are a good God. God, we, we thank you that you're intentional with the way that you love us. God, that you had to go to Samaria for that woman the same way that you will go to any depth for us. Father, we pray this morning that for those in this room who are taking the mask off, that though it may hurt, that though there may be some pain, that though there may be some awkwardness, God, that there would be healing in your name. God, for those who are just starting new, who, who are saying, I want to put my faith in you, God. Father, we pray that we, we would, you would be our Savior, God, that we've messed up, that we've made mistakes, God. We own that. But, Father, you say that you forgive those. Father, we believe that you went to a cross that was for us. You died a death that we deserved, but you rose again three days later, God. So, Father, we love you, we praise you, and we give you this moment. In your name. Let's stand together. Let's give Jesus praise one more time today.
Jesus, far and above all other names, you are the one, Jesus. We love you. God bless you guys. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you right here next Sunday.